Any good? Porter. Hi, I'm Tyler Crook, artist of Harrow County and BPRD, and you're listening to Southern Fried Geekery. Well, we used to have we used to plug into the same spot every time. It used to be one, two, three, four, and that's the way we are today. But then we started sitting differently at the tables, and it kind of fucked up. I mean, it makes a point I mean, because it doesn't matter what like if you do it on each end of the cord, like it doesn't matter where it's plugged in at the no. Like, I'm on saying each end the end of the cord and on the mic. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, not only that, but even if you just do the each end of the cords, then you know, like, oh, that's got a purple dot. That's got a purple dot. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that that might be smart. Yeah. I'll bring I'll bring some of my tabs like next week. On the- I don't like it. I don't think we should do that. <laughs> Some fingernail Too bad you're <laughs> overruled. <laughs> I'll bring my tabs next week. They're all going to be different shades of red. <laughs> Sustained. Uh, I'm colorblind. Able- it will yeah. not help me. Yeah, I, was say, I won't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have Dalton come in and plug up the mic. So. <laughs> we- oh, that's right. He's colorblind, too. Yeah. I'm not really colorblind. Uh, are you? Mm-hmm. You are really colorblind. What, shirt, what color shirt are you wearing? Tonight? Well, so I have, tr- my, I have trouble with... Um, Blues, purples, browns, greens. So you're not allowed to criticize colors in comics anymore. I have often have I. (laughs) Not often. (laughs) That's why his favorite shit is the old. You can't. You can't. can't be pissed at Caleb and I for talking about Wolverine's brown pants. This is a valid point. <laughs> this is that this that we're talking about oh, you principle brown here. <laughs> we're talking about principle. Oh, by bringing up the brown pants, yeah. it triggered him. <laughs> I had a I had a green. To his he got so pissed off at the prism separated. <laughs> 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 I had a green couch for five years. I thought was gray. Yeah. I did gave. I really? did. I gave it to my brother a couple years later. I'm like. Why the fuck did you buy a green couch? He is didn't. He bought a green couch. No, well, I gave, <laughs> no, I thought, I know, yeah. but that's what is that? What no, he didn't say that because I gave it to him. For, I just gave it to him. So he yeah. was happy to have a free couch. But later, I asked him. I was like, "Where's that? Uh, I was like, Where's that couch I gave you?" And he's like, "What are you talking about?" I was like, "The green couch." And he goes, "You didn't fucking give me a green. What are you talking about?" I said, "I've only given you one couch, asshole." And he's like, "He goes, that was that was green." That was, I said, "Gray," and he said, "That was green." <laughs> It's like, Christ, I had a green couch? <laughs> <laughs> no wonders no one would sleep with me. <laughs> they thought my taste was horrible. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the Southern Fried Geekery <laughs> podcast, where we have as many opinions as there are colors in the world, and sometimes we can see the difference in them. Uh, <laughs> so there's three? Well, four of us can see the different colors. <laughs> one of us sees in, in, well, see, he sees the shades of gray. That's... He, he, can, he can, right? Ooh, no. Why? Oh, there, had Sean, it. It God had damn it. it. You said shades of gray. It was You handed it to me. Get out. Don't anyway. Get Matt loves a gray Hulk. <laughs> hey, gray Hulk is good Hulk. Right. All right, so uh, this is episode 85, and um, we're not just talking about colors today. We're talking about a little bit of everything. Ooh. I am one of your illustrious co-hosts, Mr. Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. Craig Lance. I thought he was going to say Mistress Caleb Alexander McKenzie. <laughs> Only on the weekends. This is uh, Jerry. And I'm Sean. <laughs> All right. And we are back to talk name. some comics. Uh, we hope you missed us. We missed you guys. It's been a, been a week. It's been a week since we've done this, where we gather around the table to talk comics and to talk uh, just stuff. I think last week was, what did we do last week? Listener questions. Listener questions. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been a long week. Um, honestly, I haven't even drank that much. I've it's, got no excuse. It's been like a three-week week for right. me. <laughs> um, so for those of you who... Most of that's been in the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> shoveling gravel in the world uh so for those of you who don't know maybe this is your first time listening to the to the podcast to the southern fried geek maybe you're just joining the family uh we're a comic book podcast and what we do is we talk about all the a a lot of stuff not necessarily just comics a bunch of geek stuff just in general uh but we talk about mainly comics uh give you a little bit of an insight to what we're reading what we think about it uh this is a this is not a spoiler free podcast so if you have not read the books and we're gonna we're gonna tell you what they are before we get into them uh but you know if you want to and you don't want things spoiled for you hit the pause button um and then go read them and then come back we want you to come back. That's kind of the general thing that we're aiming for. That's a goal. Yeah. Please come back. <laughs> yeah. Don't leave forever. Just read the books yes. and then come back and listen to our takes. Hit on the that. pause button, not the delete button. <laughs> so, um, And then come come talk to us about it, about what you're reading, about what you're into, about the things you like. And how do you do that? How do you come talk to us? If I mean, you can yell into your into whatever you're listening to the podcast on. Just scream into the void. We'll most of the time, you. that doesn't necessarily work as well as you would think. Um, but who who can tell them? Who can tell them how to find how to find us and communicate with us outside of the podcast? I think we have a Facebook page. We, oh, we have, yes, we have a group. Yes, 
And we have an we, email. We, we had a page, RIP page. <laughs> <laughs> we have an email. We do. We have a uh, Twitter uh-huh. where we can Twitter at people. <laughs> Twitting and tweeting. And, and we have a uh, Instagram page. We do. We have all of those things. And they are all some form of at SFG podcast. They we are. had a Tumblr page, but then Tumblr banned porn, so we had to take it off. God damn it. That's facts. Stupid oh, Tumblr. Man. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> we, we also had a Tinder page, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> what did both of you do? <laughs> somebody, somebody did a Rule 34 version of our podcast, and it was not great. <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. Um, but no, Craig is 1,017.5% right. You can come email that us. That rarely happens. Damn, that's a lot. Exactly. Line. It is, right? Uh, you can email us at southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. And uh, on the Twitters, and on the Instagram, at least, you can find us at, S- at SFG Podcast. It's the at symbol. You don't actually have to type in at. That's how, <laughs> that's how computers work. Um, yeah, so I remember reading a Walking Dead comic one time, and in the letters part of it, somebody used the at symbol instead of typing at. Mm-hmm. And Kirkman went on for like four different response. He kept coming back to it like, why would you type the at symbol? You didn't save it. And he's like responding to somebody else, and he's like, I can't get over the fact that that other person used the at symbol. That is awesome. <laughs> It really, so it's one of those things because it really doesn't save you any keystrokes no, at all. No. I don't like it's, I, but I do it all the time. Right. Even even when I'm typing, like I'll take the extra time, the extra well, keystrokes. I mean, advice. I mean, do, do, don't, they, do they have a an amount of characters that you can use? Because I mean, it would save you characters. right? That's true. We Maybe, but I, I don't think so yeah. because those letter columns anymore are pretty long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Know, letter column. Yeah. I, it, if arguably they've gotten shorter. Yeah. Don't uh, don't send Kirkman an at sign. Unless you want to be ridiculed. I'm just going like to send the rest him all of, of That's all I'm going to send him. Just add, 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 add. Sounds like if you want some extra attention, that's how you do it. <laughs> and when I'm talking about Star Wars, those big walkie things, it's going to be two ad symbols. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you guys could see the look that Craig is giving me. I'm uh, thinking about throwing the table the right now. Legs, <laughs> it's the four legs, right? It's the dog? Yes. Yeah. The A-T-S-T. It's the dog. The good boy. Is, uh, <laughs> is the two-legged version. Well, All right. At symbols aside, <laughs> what, what all did you, what all did you guys read this week? Let's let's talk about some short stacks. Uh, short stacks being three comics that we read this week, or three things I should say that we read this week uh, that we really enjoyed. So uh, why don't you kick us off? We'll go we'll go clockwise or counterclockwise because oh. oh. that's how clocks. <clears throat> oh, we're only talking about things we enjoyed. Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Maybe maybe things you didn't enjoy. Okay, good because I three things. I would have failed. That was the... <laughs> so I read. Uh... <laughs> The current Punisher series, Punisher number 14 by Matthew Rosenberg. I can understand why you didn't like that one. Yeah, Simon (laughs) Kredansky and Antonio Fabella. Yeah, this one went way off the rails for me personally. Uh, Next, I read... (laughs) (laughs) Moving on, I read uh, Savage Avengers number four. Oh, yeah, there's another one. (laughs) Speaking of rails. It was not a good week. Was this a hate week for you? Man, uh, unintentionally. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Jerry Dugan, Mike Diodato Jr., Frank Martin. Yeah, this one went also went way off the rails for me. So, yeah, two strikes, Marvel. Uh, then I read Sinestro by uh, DC Comics, Mark Russell, Yild, Yildire Sinar, Julio Ferreira, and Steve Wands. Now, this one was good. No, um, no. I have no interest in Sinestro. And just like reading his uh, Harley Quinn one-shot, I had no interest in current Harley Quinn. I enjoyed this for the same reason I enjoyed that. It's just a damn good story. And it was extremely timely for me personally. That was what amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, it's dealt with something I dealt with this very week. Um, in short, it's all about employer employee relationships. Mark Russell has a way of like reaching into our brains. I just want to know how long it's going to be before Matt gets a Mark Russell tattoo. <laughs> like just a portrait of him. It's got to be the fashion. Twitter version where he's wearing like the glasses. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you read this week, Jerry? Drop some uh, brilliance on us, buddy. Absolute Carnage number one. Nice. Donnie Cates, Ryan Segman, J.P. Mayer, and Frank Martin. Uh, it's basically starting off the culmination of uh, their run, like year and a half run of Venom so far. Um, good stuff. A uh, lot of horror elements to it. It was pretty fantastic. It was a good um, one. Die number six by uh, Kerry Gillian, Stephanie Hans, Clayton Cowles, Rian. Rian? Is it Rian or Ryan? 
It's R I A N. Ryan. Ryan Hughes, Chrissy Williams. Uh, it started the uh, the new story arc with the party being split, and there were some feels mm-hmm. to be had in this issue. Yeah, there uh, were. It's good stuff. Uh, the remaining group that wants to get home has to get out of the um, the capital city that they're in because it's now occupied by an enemy force, and uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. They get pretty creative with how they get if out. If you're a dog person, prepare to cry. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, and honestly, the, the I don't want to say it's a surprise that I'm really enjoying this or that it's really good because Sean has been, you know, giving it critical acclaim since I've, I've first met him. And it's, uh, it's called Bakuman. It's a um, manga written by uh, Sugumi Oba and illustrated by Takeshi Obata. Um, and it's a fantastic series. We actually um, had a manga ramen about it at one point. Sean yeah. went into detail about it. It's the same same team that, that brought you Death Note. Um, but the series is, is about two two guys. One illustrates, one writes. And they're trying to make it in the, uh, the manga industry. And it gives you a lot of really, really cool insight on just that industry in general. Uh, and primarily shown in jump how the the editors you know play their role and how all of the um, uh, the fans you know uh, it depends on how popular a series is and yeah, stuff like that. the voting that. process at the yeah. determines if a manga stays it's, or not. It's been a fantastic series. Uh, I think there's like 200 something chapters and I'm on I'm only on 25 so far. So I cannot wait to see where this series goes. That's 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 a short it's, run for one of your mangas, right? Right. <laughs> I I, uh, I've, I finally finished One Punch Man. I think it was around 100 something chapters. So. Nice. Yeah. Nice. What you got, Craig? What'd you read this week, brother? So I read uh, Green Lantern number 10. Which uh, is, of course, DC, Grant Morrison, Liam Sharp, and Steve Olaf. Uh, it's the Green Lanterns of the Multiverse, which we get Green Lantern of Earth 47, which, if you haven't read this, is a hippie pot smoking Green Lantern. And it's amazing because he's in the same team as Earth uh, 32's Green Lantern, mm-hmm. which happens to be Batman. <laughs> and you can imagine how a hippie. Green Lantern would get under the skin of <laughs> Batman is Green Lantern. I can see that. Yeah. And then uh, Coffin Bound number one by Dan Waters and Danny. Uh, this book is so good. Uh, l- let me just, she has a vulture sidekick that's a humanoid and wears a birdcage over its head over the vulture part. That, that enough is reason enough to read the book, but yeah, it's really fucking good. It, it was it was almost on my short set until Craig told me that it was on his. Uh, it, it's set. likely to be my book of the week and on our nah, next yeah, comic. Okay, cool. I'll have to read poetry. that. Uh, Birthright number thirty-eight. Joshua Williamson, Andre Bresson, and Adriano Lucas. It's an image book. Uh, the story is continuing on, and it's pretty great. It's about a kid that ended up in another world. And uh, where he was the chosen one, he eventually comes back to Earth to save it. A lot of other bullshit happens. But beyond that, the art in this is fucking fantastic. Uh, and it just gets better per issue. Uh, uh, Lucas and uh, Bresson are both going on my short list of artists for color and okay. penciler for the year because of this nice. book. So Sweet. <laughs> Sean, what you got, brother? Uh, it was a surprise of nobody. Uh, House of X number two uh-huh. Mar- went from Hickman, Laraz, and Gracia. Uh, again, continuing this amazing story that uh, Hickman is laying out for us. Also read a uh, Sea of Stars number two from Image from Jason Aaron, Dennis Hallam, and Stephen Green. Uh, this issue was really good. Like I said, the first one had me interested, and I still wasn't one hundred percent sold. But this one focused a lot more on the dad, and I'm like really digging that. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of this series. I also read uh, Ronan Island number five from Boom Studios. This is from Greg Pak, Giannis Melagianis, and Irma Nevilia. Uh, it's number five. I think it's going to go 12 issues for this Ronan Island arc, which is a lot longer than I thought it was going. And yeah. it's just keeping interesting with the, the combination of the different cultures from Korea, China, and Japan and this, uh, not post apocalyptic, but like zombie apocalyptic, mm-hmm. I guess, kind of scenario. It's been a really good series. I'm still digging the hell out of it. Yeah, it has been. I think it was supposed to start off initially as a six issue yeah, series. And yeah. because it did the same thing with Greg Pocky, especially his All Ages book, it did the same thing as like Met Cadet You did. And mm-hmm. it got like extended, which oh, is awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Have you read Met Cadet You? I have not. You got to read that. Yeah. It's a book made. Oh, you mentioned it's it before. Been on my yeah. list for a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the hotness. Okay. Go dig it. Uh, 
Yeah, I kind of fell off of that book, but not for any reason other than just sheer quantity. Sheer quantity, <laughs> yeah. Um, Greg Pak usually is amazing. So nice. He he usually is. Yeah. Uh, he he, had he has a, his misses. He had, he swung and miss on one with me this week. Uh oh. Yeah, uh, which I I wasn't even gonna necessarily prepare to talk about it. Uh, but shit, why not? Um, you make your short stack four. Huh? Make your short <laughs> stack four. You don't uh, break rules around here. <laughs> yeah, he um, he wrote a series this. I don't even remember off the top of my head what it was. It was a new it was a new number one that I read that extends out of uh, oh it was the new Agents of Atlas book that he oh, did yeah. and because I wasn't prepared to talk about it and because I thought yeah, the no, 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 it's all good. art was not um, not it, the art was not something that I appreciated. I don't remember who did the art. It wasn't a name I recognized. Um, but yeah, I, I was one and done on that. You book. can you can tell when Marvel really knows a book's not going to work by the artist they put on yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm all down for giving people new chances. That just wasn't, yeah. The new Agents of Atlas. I loved the mini series that he did for out of War of the Realms, but this wasn't this wasn't that. Yeah, um, didn't didn't dig it. But outside of that, I did read a couple of things that I I thought were worth were notable, were worth mentioning. Um, and so I I've been on a kick reading omnibuses lately. Yeah. And so my latest one that I broke out, and I actually put it on our Facebook group page because every once in a while I like to get people involved, right? So I'll put out a poll or something it's like, hey, I have these two omnibuses, omnibu, right. omnibu, which one should I read? <laughs> um, and this one, the choice was between Lone Wolf and Cub and Savage Sword of Sonan. Conan. Now, Sonan. Sonan, yes. Sonan. 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 Yes. That's We're going like, to talk about that book in a minute. That's Red Sonia and Conan's daughter, Sonan. Um, <laughs> the whole bet she's <laughs> bet she's buff as fuck. Uh, but so <laughs> the the people who voted on that um, kind of <laughs> wow, um, they kind of overrode me. I was I was I, I love Conan, but I was kind of I had my hopes up that uh, Lone Wolf and Cub was going to win, but it didn't. Savage Sword won, so I'm going through and reading Savage Sword of Conan. And I've, there's no way I'm going to be disappointed in that, right? Like, it's just, it's it's the original, it's the OG Savage Sword. Right. Uh, you, I mean, it's Roy Thomas writing Conan. Yeah. It's, uh, it's everybody and their brother working on that book. All the different pulp stories that are in it are, are fantastic. Um, you just, you can't beat it. I also, to my, to my happy surprise, found a book that I just absolutely fell in love with. And it's only going to be a two-issue kind of mini series and that is the island of dr moreau it's a adaptation uh, a very liberal adaptation of a- the hg wells story written in 1986 uh but it's this one of the hg wells books i did not read oh dude I- i've read it and it's it's very much of its time so it's it's like reading it now it's hard to read but it's not uh it's it's still good um gabriel rodriguez did the art on that book it, rodriguez I, it's is gorgeous good. Absolutely gorgeous. Ted Adams wrote it. Nelson Daniel uh, did the colors, and Robbie Robbins on the on the letters. Just a good team. It was a great adaptation. It there was nothing about that book I didn't absolutely enjoy. I, yeah, and and it's getting a lot of online buzz that makes me really really happy. And uh, yeah, and much like Sean, I read uh, House of X number two, which is the third in Hickman's. Yeah. Uh, X series um, that you know you'll be you'll, you'll be happy that we're not going to make that our book of the week. We thought about it. <laughs> oh but. my god, it was so hard not to. <laughs> um, again, Pepe Larraz, and and I'm a more I'm I'm becoming a mark for artists more so than anything. And Pepe Larraz is a beast, dude. I, I love that guy. Um, everything said, he does makes me the happy camper. I've said it before. I'll I will stay on a mediocre mediocrely written book. Is mm-hmm. that a word? Mediocrely written now. book. Uh, that's got great art in it longer than I'll stay on a great written book with mediocre art. Yeah. Um, good art can save bad writing. Bad writing can't save or good writing. Can't save bad art yeah. for me. It just, yeah, I, I agree. That's, that's a hundred percent true yeah. for me. Well, all right. Y'all want to talk about some comics? <clears throat> yeah. Let's talk about let's some comics. Let's do this. Let's break it open. So we're going to do what we always do. And we're going to round table a book. This is a book that all five of us at the table have read. Uh, we pick it usually on Wednesdays. It's a new book that came out this week. And that the, the book we chose this week, um, uh, if we hadn't have done two weeks worth of Marvel books already, uh, you know, I, I mentioned like a month ago, we did just week after week of DC books, and then we did two weeks of Marvel books. Honestly, this maybe not, there was another book that maybe deserved to be, and, and, and Jerry had, had suggested it, but doing too much Marvel, just like too much DC is too much uh so we decided to <laughs> to break to, to break from that uh trend and mainly because also i yeah and craig said this best i think this book is probably gonna be jerry's book of the week at some point maybe 
Uh, he's shaking his head no. Not the one we're talking about. Oh, the absolute oh, carnage. Oh, yeah, absolute gotcha. carnage. I, I yeah. Were no, we were, ta- I was talking about how, yeah. how we decided not to do absolute carnage. Um, and I, cause I, I do want that to be your book of the week. Hopefully at some point. Um, cause I really hope you dug it. Do it, Jerry. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> we got to now. It's been uh, established. But we decided to go with a book from Dark Horse. And this book is, is one I've been excited for, for a while. And it's Berserker Unbound. Um, Excited for this on two fronts. The first front was because it's called Berserker Unbound. It's a very Conan esque story, uh, and you guys know me. That's that's right in my wheelhouse. I mean, I'm reading Savage sort of Conan Omnibus. Uh, I love it, uh, but also because of the the team that's creating this book, and it's the team of Jeff Lemire, Mike Diodato Jr., Frank Martin, and Steve Wands, uh, which in theory, at least on paper. Just it, when I saw this in the in the solicitations, really kicked me over the moon. I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I want. It, it's everything. So let's. You guys want to dig into it for a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So this this book, it's very traditional. At least the way and it starts off, it's a very traditional uh, berserker barbarian story. Um, you have got this character who we we don't necessarily know his real name, uh, but he is called the the king of the mongrels. Uh, he is he is a, an individual who is. He's gone out seeking battle and glory. He's walking in the wilds. Uh, he's been away from home uh, doing barbarian things. He's got an axe. He's got a sword because you can't just have one. They're like Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. Um, and so he's just been out and doing his thing. He's, you know, traveling the wilderness, fighting his battles, uh, seeking out glory. But he's on his way home. He's, he's had enough. He wants to go check in. He's, he's got a wife and his daughter. And that's really who he does the things that he does for uh, f- for them. He's a, he's a family man at some extent. But as he approaches his village, uh, much to his dismay, he starts seeing some smoke. Uh, but he, what he doesn't hear are the noises that a village should have. Uh, there, there are no hustle and bustle of the markets. There are no children playing, you know. It's just it's eerily quiet except for the smoke. This does not bode well, as you can imagine. This is not a thing that that he uh, has good feelings about. Um, as he gets closer to his village, uh, his worst fears are kind of confirmed. Um, his village has been raided. Uh, everything has been destroyed, and unfortunately, in, in in a moment that should tug on your heartstrings, he finds his wife and daughter murdered. Uh, you know, the people who are his driving force, his reason for being, are laying on the ground in a bloody heap. Uh, and they're, they're just done for. They're, they're, there's no saving them. They're, they're, they're gone. Um, and his, his heart is actively breaking. Uh, but he really doesn't have time to kind of wallow. He doesn't have time to, to sink into the feelings or anything. Because the people that did this have not left. They, they are still there. And they're these kind of dog soldiers. Uh, they're these also barbarian-like creatures. They're, they're wearing skins of dogs on their heads. Um, and they attack, uh, and <laughs> these poor bastards aren't ready. They <laughs> they don't realize that they're they're dealing with the king of the mongrels. They're dealing with the most ferocious, the the most the deadliest sword in all the lands. Um, and as they they send, a, they had this very three hundred esque moment to where they send a three you know just a, a cloud of arrows at him, and he blocks them all and just rages into them. Blood, gore. There's body parts flying everywhere. He's he's just taking no prisoners, he's giving no quarter, he's going for the gold medal in death. Um, and I, I think if there was a gold medal in death, he would he would get it. <laughs> um, so he just clears, clears these dog soldiers out. Uh, and a little bit of a distance away, at the end of, uh, at the end of like this opening, he sees this, this other figure. And it's not a soldier. It's not somebody who, who's doing battle. And he's kind of holding a glaive, a, uh, a scythe of some sort. He, he's a he's a sorcerer esque, and he puts a curse on on our our hero. Uh, just he's like you know this is. He, he gives a little bit of a poetic moment, very very old school, very like I said, Roy Thomas esque. Uh, and as this happens, our, our king, uh, our not Conan, because um, they don't have the rights to his name. Uh, he he contemplates giving up. He contemplates it. He sinks to, he's sinking to his knees. He's like, uh, there's more dog soldiers coming. He's like, why don't I just let him die? I could go be with my daughter. Um, this could be it for me. I could just let them have it. They can pull my head from my shoulders. I could just go. But that's not who he is, right? Like, the, the, the blood rage is... It'd be a very short comic. It I would be. Uh, <laughs> but the numbers are insurmountable, right? Like, they're, the, the odds are against him. 
he's not going to commit suicide uh, either by wading into the to an unwinnable battle or also just sitting there and letting him take him. So he runs. Uh, he he calls himself a coward, as uh, you, you know, Craig, you you pointed out, and just flees. But as he's fleeing, something something strange happens. He 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 finds this cave. Uh, and I guess he's going to go hide in it or something and let the the danger pass by. But either as an aspect of the curse that was put on him earlier in the book, or maybe it's just a magic cave. It, it, the, the story isn't clear. It allows you to come up with your own ideas based on it. A portal opens, and the king of the mongrels like falls into it. He it, there's all there's beautiful. It's beautifully beautifully rendered uh, by Diodato Junior. Um, but it's all these like light green green lightning crackle he sinks into it there's skeletons of of monsters there's tentacles there's giant eyeballs just floating all past him and when he wakes up he's he's in this area and he wonders for a moment and he's like did did i die maybe maybe this is where i get the moment where i get to pick my my eternal damnation i get to pick the torture that i'll have uh for forever like because there's all of these little symbols um some of them are reminiscent of like japanese kanji some of them are just uh Mercurial imagery, yeah. Christmas tree, and yeah. a pumpkin, and <laughs> Easter egg. Yeah, um, yeah. Ma- magical emojis. <laughs> um, and so, but the, but that's not what this is. This aspect of this curse, and as it as it erupts, explodes in front of him, he he wakes up in a clearing, and he's he's got everything he had before. He's got his battle axe. He's got his he's got his sword. He's got his totally not he man garb, um, but he doesn't know where he's at. And he's he's trying to figure this out, but somebody starts poking him with a stick, you know. Like, who who is this person poking? And it, 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 he opens his eyes and he sees this this man, and he's he's a black man. He's African African American dude. Come to find out, um, <laughs> which kind of spoils a little bit where it's going. But this guy's like, hey, what are you what are you doing? Why why are you why are you laying here? What's up with your weird cosplay? Um, like you know, did you miss the bus? What what's going on? Like, or did you come up here to steal all my shit? Because you're not going to steal all my shit. And so as our Lord of the Mongrels kind of gets his bearings and is like trying to figure out who this weird man is, poking him with a stick, he walks up on a hill and he sees a booming metropolis. And that's where our story closes. It's, just, it's very uh, Manhattan-esque imagery. There's skyscrapers. So he wakes up in the modern world. Uh, and just and that's where our story is going to go from there. Uh, so the, as the story closes, I'm kind of curious for you guys uh, what you all thought about i, I want to go book. last on this okay um so we'll start with sean what do you think about this book bud the art was absolutely phenomenal i, I absolutely love del dotto jr's art on this channel very i see very jim lee uh inspiration i think in his art style which mm-hmm. is a, a high compliment for me storyline wise honestly lemire didn't bring anything really new to the table but I also know Lemire is a fantastic writer. I mean, like you said, we've, we said it Conan-esque and travel to another world. It's nothing new, but I trust Lemire's writing. So I'm definitely, I'm going to stick on for a few more issues. I see art alone is worth the price of admission for me. Okay. But it's okay. It's not nothing bad. Just, I don't know. It wouldn't, for me, it didn't bring anything too much new to the table. But beyond that, though, it's still a solid book. Okay. Sweet. Matt. Uh, you know, when I finished reading this, uh, one word popped out in my mind, and that was lazy. Um as far as the writing goes the art was great i really i really dug the art in this book but the story as a whole i felt was i mean if this felt like a, a story that you could throw together and while you're eating lunch there's <laughs> nothing new it's very tropey the dialogue is very tropey i was really felt really let down by jeff lemire by this story um it just did nothing for me i mean you know if if you had handed this book to me and didn't tell me that who who was writing it I would drop it. I'd be like, well, this is this is this is a generic barbarian story where he wakes up in a city, but it's Jeff Lemire, so I'm going to hang on. You know, I can only assume that the gravity of the story is going to happen starting in issue two, um, and that this one was simply a setup. Okay, Jerry, what do you think about it, man? Yeah, that's basically where I am. Uh, the like some of the dialogue felt like way more juvenile than. I'm used to with Lemire and like Craig and I had talked about it last night and it's like, you know, we kind of hold Lemire at a higher standard than a lot of other mm-hmm. writers. So it, it's, it's a little, I mean, and, and I agree with Matt, like he's definitely going to do 
probably great things with this series and everything. It just didn't start in this issue. Right. Um, and, it, and it was very, like, formulaic and, and, you know, somewhat still. I mean, and the, I mean, the art was the biggest grasping point for it. It, it was amazing. Fantastic art. But, yeah, the, the dialogue and the setup for the, the first issue just didn't really do a lot for me. Yeah. Uh, I'll go next. So I'm of two minds about this book. Um, I understand completely what all of you are saying about it. Felt very generic and everything. But I mean, I'm also <laughs> it's a barbarian story. I I don't mind generic barbarian stories. Like I said, as I'm as I'm going back and reading, I'm about halfway through the the Savage Sword Omnibus. Um, there's a lot of generic Roy Thomas barbarian stories, and so I don't necessarily mind just just a, a run of the mill barbarian story, just because I love that world. Uh, that being said, I it's very tropey, um, and and like I mean Jerry, you put it amazingly the best way I think that I, I couldn't put any better. Um, we hold Jeff Lemire to a different standard. I hold Jeff Lemire to a higher standard. Um, so Jeff Lemire does not get the first issue pass for me because I've read Jeff Lemire first issues where things just explode. Right. It goes nuts where he's, he's he writes the human condition better than probably anybody else can. Um, that wasn't there in yeah. this this yeah. book whatsoever. Um, and, and for Jeff Lemire to give me a story where a wife and a child die and to make me feel zero things... That that says that there's not. I don't know if he wasn't into it, or or maybe that maybe Jeff Lemire just wants to write a straightforward old school barbarian story, and that's that's fine. But that's not the Jeff Lemire I sign up for. And and I mean that even just sounded like it was softball pitch to us because it was literally like he mentioned them, yeah, a, like a page or a panel before that. <laughs> so then of course like the next page they're gonna you know be yeah. dead. Well, and he calls the daughter baby girl twice before yeah. he finally felt like I can see yeah. halfway through the name Jeff Lemire like, oh yeah, her name's going to be this. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> again, I, I don't dislike it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not that we're not mad at you. We're just disappointed. Um, <laughs> Jeff Lemire is where I'm at with it. And, and uh, Diodato's art really strike. Like you give me zip tone. I'm a happy person. Um, that, that's really when it comes to, to me, like this book overdoses on zip tone and I, I revel in it. Um, I think it's great. I, I like Diodato Jr. He looks good. He looks good both in this and the other book that he's writing that's just like this. <laughs> so, um, Or drawing that's just like this. Okay. I'm going to call both of you two out, and I'm talking okay. about Caleb and Matt. If okay. this <laughs> book had the title Conan on it, mm-hmm. you both would love this book. And you can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> I will. It's got, it's got violence in it. Yeah. It's a straight-up barbarian story. Yeah. It's the same setup as Conan's origin story is, I mean, essentially his family's killed and he's left to, to deal with it. Um, this book is better than you guys are giving it credit for because you're dead inside and you can't feel the pain <laughs> of loss for this man's child and wife when he's standing there holding his dead wife in his arms crying mm-hmm. after you know, talking about how much of a badass he is, and, and then he's sitting there crying. If you can't feel that, that's on you, not Jeff Lemire. We've already got those. Co- he, th- that's my problem. Is this has already been done? That was my. That's the only problem I had. Is so, I've already read this story. He, so I, there's you, nothing inventive or new. Was the problem? Do you believe that this is the total story? No, I, and that's why I said I believe the gravity of everything is right. going to start an issue too. I'm just talking about it as a standalone issue. It's like he. It's like he took a generic. Conan story called it Berserker Unbound mm-hmm. and that's how he's starting his story mm-hmm. that's what irritated me about it is he brought nothing new to I, the I genre. guarantee you there's a reason for that well that's what I'm betting on that's why he's going to yeah, get my it, money for it's his absolute, time. But, it, but it's not in this book yeah I'm just talking about yeah, what's yeah, in this book but you're right we're judging one book based on the totality of this one mm-hmm. book right for me this book on its own was perfectly fine well no and that's that's what i said i'm not i'm not mad at this book yeah I, it, it's a it, <laughs> i like generic conan stories yeah it, it's um, a it's a good book to me the art of course as you guys said completely yeah. sells it the uh the story itself to me it had everything in it that's required and uh, we get spoiled by jeff lemire a lot because a lot of his books are written in omnibus form or mm-hmm. graphic novel form and so like if you go read underwater weld welder and you take what would be the first issue out of that i guarantee you you're going man eh, this is just a mm, so i disagree with that i can read the first 20 pages of underwater welder and there's a whole lot of poignant shit in that book okay or essex pages. county Still, I, I don't agree with you. I think okay. that I think that every one of those stories has some sort of setup. 
Um, you didn't know until about the fourth book in Royal Family what was really going on with Royal it. City. Royal City. Royal yeah. City, yeah. What was going on with it. But you trusted it because it was Lemire and it's a story about a family. True. No, no, I don't. I don't. This is a different story for Mm -hmm. Lemire that's taking place. We've never seen him write a barbarian story before. We've never seen it. I haven't read a book like this from him before. And so I'm willing to to 100 percent buy in that this is not going to be a generic barbarian story. No, I, I don't think it will. Yeah. And like you said, uh, we've never seen Lemire write a barbarian story, and that part of that also kind of makes me wish. And I'm sure, like I said, he's got a big scheme. It's Lemire. We know it's going to build to something. The way it started and the way it ended, I kind of wish it stayed. It wasn't a, for me and Jerry would know the word, the Anissa K story with a barbarian. <laughs> I kind of wish it would have stayed in the fantasy world. I actually would love to see Lemire write that's... a full fantasy story. Now, in the, now, I'm not saying this might not be an interesting one. I just remember I rolled my eyes personally when they when they announced, I think it was Savage Avengers, Conan being brought to the modern world. Mm-hmm. I just don't personally dig those stories. But again, like I'm staying on this book because I trust Lemire. But like personally, I, was like, I would love to see him write just a full-on fantasy world. Even if it is starting off as a generic Conan story, I have faith he's going to go into something bigger. <clears throat> I mean, it's okay that we all don't see night eye to eye on no, it. Again, but, but, but no, I mean, you make it sound like I said I didn't like it. I think it's no, fine. I, mean, I, think the story, I was kind of playing. Well, no, no, I, I realized. <laughs> no, no, I'm, no, I'm not. Oh, yeah, double down, I'm, double no, down. I'm not. I mean, <laughs> I was kind of messing with you and Matt. I realize that both of you are not hating on this book. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's fine. I think it's a little better than fine. Okay. Um, you guys are, you guys are, I don't think it's fantastic. I don't think it's the best thing I've ever written by Jeff Lemire. And if I'm rating on the Jeff Lemire scale, it's at the lower end as yeah. a single issue book. If I'm putting this book up against 80% of the other books that are on the market right now, mm-hmm. it's still an A book for me or an A minus. It's, it's a mid range book. Um, and again, that's just partially because of the Jeff Lemire scale. Yeah. Uh, be- because Jeff Lemire, we know what Jeff Lemire can give us. So there's, in, in literary theory, there's this idea that um, if you if you show me a body, and you haven't made me care for it, that body's a prop, and it's it's a it's a it's a tool to to go to on make the plot go further. If you uh, give me a body and you expect it to be some type of character character development. You have to have given me a reason to care about the body. Um, I can bring my own baggage to what a marriage uh, is and to what, not fatherhood, obviously, because I'm not a father, but to what caring for a small child is and having those relations. So I can bring my baggage into that and I can place that there. But as far as the merits of the story, Jeff Lemire doesn't do any building to make me give a shit that these characters are dead. Other than one line saying, I do this for them, where he doesn't even say the daughter's name. Uh, that's just, like, it's, again, it's just, it's, it's a fine story. It's just... I, I, I maybe I built this up to be to the expectation being higher in my mind, but you, before before we go into something else, so I just want to say that we get something very similar to this in uh, the last little Avengers miniseries, No Road Home, when they bring again Conan in that book. They bring Conan to modern era. Um, that was better done. That was better executed, and it, it gave me a reason to feel something for that. And and I can supplement Conan in this book and be just fine with it. Um, Savage Avengers, which is also being drawn by Diodato Jr., I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you give me a reason to care that, that Conan's in the at least the modern time, or that this barbarian figure who's, again, an analog in this book is in the modern time. There's nothing really here for that. I'm more interested, at the end of this story, I'm more interested in, in the... And then that what if you read the the synopsis, the homeless man that's poking him with a stick. I'm more I care more about his story, um, just from the two pages he was in it than I do the the, the barbarian. So the difference, as far as ju- you know, the reason I don't judge this book the same way I would a Conan book is simply because Conan the Barbarian's character has been established. Right. So it's kind of like I'll put it to you this way: like reading that first issue of Jim Zub's Savage Sword, where Conan is sitting across the table in an alehouse with somebody. If this character was sitting across the table of an alehouse having a conversation, they'd be like, this sucks. But Conan, you know his thinking, you know his motivations, mm-hmm. you know his the you know the danger that he represents and what triggers him. It's a lot different when you know that watching a conversation with that character. With this character, you know, nothing was established. We don't I mean, you know, we have a few pages of I like to roam around and kick ass. 
and that's and that's why it was it felt lazy to me. Is nothing was established with the character other than well, my family's dead now. I'm upset. I think Lemire is asking you the know. reader to supplement a whole lot of feelings about Conan. In yeah, this book that's not a Conan. Book. Yeah, so that's why I don't judge it in the same way I would a Conan story. It's because the character of Conan has been established. So I think that this first issue mm -hmm. is meant to feel like a Conan book, mm -hmm. but this is not a Conan story. No, for sure. It, it's not. I want to be 100%. This story is a, a fish out of water story because mm -hmm. he's getting ready to be in this other world uh, to address that part of it. Uh, just, I think what we're all saying, it may not have been necessarily the, the best start for a lot of us, but I think every yeah. one of us is still interested in no, seeing where sure. it's going to go. So, I mean, like I said, and if... You like violence, you like beautiful art, you like barbarians in a modern setting, hey, you should check out this book, I think. Yeah. No, I, I, I yeah, the book's, it's on my pull list. It's staying on my pull list. I mean, and again, when I say that it's just fine for me, it, like I said, if, if and Craig, you're 1,000% you're right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what you said and I'm going to flip it. Not if this was a Conan story, but if this was a, this story written by 90% of the other people writing in comics today. It's a good story. It's great. No, I love it. Like it's it's fun. It's it's. I, I don't mind reading stories that I'm going to forget in a year I, I, because they're entertaining at the moment. And for a medium like comics, that it is a disposable medium on surface, that's fine. Like you're, you're you're entertaining me for the 15 minutes it takes me to read a book, and that's that's really all I ask for. Um, but because of whose name is on the front of this book, I, I can't give it that. And and even though, yeah, I do fully believe that L Lemire's going to give us something incredible before it's all said and done with, this book is not a, it, it didn't build that for me yet. The second issue might. Uh, this uh, this book is asking me to, number one, bring my own baggage from a completely separate character. Uh, number two, care about the emotions of this character based on my own real world ideologies of what family is. And it doesn't build that. I mean, it be, you also give me a character that, that will leave that family and go, slay and conquer and do all that stuff and, and then come back and wonder well, he's not there to protect his family. Um, so you're not giving me in this issue the investiture that that I think Jeff Lemire is asking for, that he is requiring based on his own reputation. We're I, assuming I that those things are required. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're assuming that those things are required for this character. I mean, maybe, but maybe that's also going to be the lesson that he learned. I mean, we can speculate. Like, yeah. maybe he's going to learn that, hey, like, I thought all these other things were important for um, for my family and for who I was supposed to be, like going off and riches and glory. But no, the real the real answer was I should have been there to protect my family. Maybe that's what he's going to learn. Mm -hmm. Sure, please maybe, maybe no. So. <laughs> he's he's going to learn that he was just a comic book character that brought him to the real world. Oh Christ! And he was crappily written barbarian comics oh, or something. God. It's gonna it's gonna turn into Roger Rabbit. Uh, I, I love I, I love the book on 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 for what I think it can be. And I think the book is is perfectly acceptable for just what it is in my hands. Um, I, but if you're asking me to bring my own baggage to it based on these other things, I'm also going to bring my Jeff Lemire baggage to it. And when I bring my Jeff Lemire baggage to it, it's it's not a letdown per se. It's just a, huh. Well, so, I, I will agree that it, it relies heavily on tropes, and that does make it a little lazy. I will, I will, I will agree yeah. on that because it's no different than the beginning of just about every fantasy movie you ever watch. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, every fantasy movie ever starts with the death of their family. I mean, fuck, Luke Skywalker's aunt and uncle are killed at the beginning of the movie, mm -hmm. and, and he doesn't even shed a tear. He just goes on with his life. Yeah. But those things are required for the hero's journey. Right. All of those things are part of the hero's journey. So when you tell a fantasy tale, there are some very... <clears throat> established tropes that you have to hit. There's beats you have to hit yeah. in a fantasy novel to pull off of a good fantasy story. Mm -hmm. He hits those beats, but maybe a little too on point, if that makes sense. Yeah. At least if this tends to be a, a... If we are four issues down the road and this is just a typical fantasy book, then it was way too on point. Yeah. If we're four issues down the road and this isn't a typical fantasy book, which I don't think it is then uh, those beats were made to make you think it was something that it's not. For sure. I still think people should go read this book. Yes, you absolutely, absolutely. should yeah. read this book. If no other reason for the art alone. Yeah. yeah. You gave me a double-page spread of him <laughs> leaning in and hacking dog soldiers to death and there's hands <laughs> flying everywhere. Uh, this, it's fucking metal. <laughs> well, I was going to say this. Uh, there's about four pages in there that are 
almost ripped from 300. You hit on that earlier. Mm -hmm. And they're done in a better way than 300. (laughs) I thought Frank Frazetta. I was like, huh. Yeah, that too. Yeah, I mean, there's that page where he's climbing up on the pile of dead bodies and still fighting. Yeah. That's straight out of 300. Yeah. (laughs) You well, know, or you could see Frazetta doing it. Frizz, you yeah. could see Wrightson doing Barry it. Barry Windsor Smith. That's yeah. A, yeah. yeah. You, I mean, those. it's very, even the art, as great as it is, fall, falls onto fantasy tropes yeah. for a fantasy story. And again, I think all of that's done for a reason. When you hit, when you hit the beats that head on, mm-hmm. that pinpoint, and you're somebody at the quality of writing that Jeff Lemire is, yeah. you're doing it for a reason. I think so. And I hope so. Um, yeah. I just I, I, I was now, hoping, if, like I was I, hoping for more. <laughs> if we oh, and and understandable, uh, but I think again, if we're through the first story arc and this is a standard fantasy book, yeah. then I'll be right there with you. Going that was a lazy first issue, but I think it's intended to throw us off. And, and on some level, like I said this earlier, Jeff Lemire just may want to be writing just a you know he's writing another book. His Black Hammer book right now is a is an homage to the golden age superhero eras with a twist. At least the main aspect of the story was. And then he goes into sci-fi and does all this other stuff. But it's that twist. You guys think that the uh, the Black Barn will show up in the series? <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Maybe maybe this is how he bridges the gap between those two things. I don't know. But yeah, so, I love when we all have a little bit different opinions. Oh, on yeah. That's why I love the round table. Man. Yeah. That's why I absolutely love the round table. Uh, because we it, can all read the same thing and draw, you know, draw five different straws out of it. Because, you know... Um, you had texted me the other day and said, "Yeah, this was kind of a miss for you," and I said, "No, I'm 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 digging it," and I said, "I'm going to reread it," and I went into it to honestly, 100, percent I was going to read it and find where Caleb was wrong. Yeah, but I I reread it 100 <laughs> percent to find the reasons why Caleb was wrong. I, I love that you read books like <laughs> with an with aspect a, of how to with an it. agenda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Watch this, <laughs> asshole. And, and I will say. I will say a hundred percent that I read the book and I couldn't find where you were wrong in your assessment, but I feel that there's more to this than what we're getting. Yes. No, again, and I like when I said that, like, it's important to remember, I'm not saying that about the series as a whole. Right. We're talking about the merits of the 28 pages. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about specifically this book, but, but it is enough to, like I said, it is enough to make me want to read the rest of it. Um, So what about you, Jerry? Do you think, because you're not necessarily a big when it comes to like this type of sword and sorcery, like yeah. like I said, old school Conan esque Red Sonja, that's not necess- like I, I think you like it when they I like give you real those fantasy, right? Yeah, uh, you like the dragons. <laughs> he likes the tentacles. You're an insensitive jerk, is what you are. <laughs> <laughs> he, he likes the tentacles and the porn. Yes. Well, I mean, th- yes, also that, but no, I mean Jer- Jerry likes the magic aspect of it. His, his, his you give Jerry the choice, I, and correct me if I'm wrong. If you give Jerry the choice between a person hitting other humans with a sword and a fucking dragon. Uh, and a wizard in a cape, Jerry's going to go with dragon wizards and capes all day long. So what did you think about this, man? Um, I, uh, yeah, like I said, it, it, I could see where he's he's going with it, right? Um, because he's, he's making it a very basic barbarian story. Mm-hmm. And he's going to show you, like, this is how I'm going to handle this type thing. Yeah. So that's why it felt so generic at the beginning, yeah. in, in my opinion. Do you think you're going to stay on it? Um, it's really hard for me to sign up for new series right now because mm-hmm. I should honestly be dwindling, dwindling yeah. my list down with the move coming up. Um, so I really don't know. That, that double page spread where the, the king of mongrels is leaning into all the dog soldiers, hacking them up. That's a metaphor for Jerry and his pull list right yeah, now. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's <laughs> tears. Right. <you> know. <laughs> now, I, I absolutely agree with you that I thought it was really bizarre that we didn't hear his daughter's name till like almost like <laughs> three pages to the end before he actually gives her a name. It's like, oh, shit, I forgot the he name. He kept her. calling her baby girl. And I'm yeah. like, hey, my daughter, <laughs> my baby girl. My, that's, yeah, that's like that. That weird war trope where they show them the picture of their family or whatever right <laughs> and as far as dialogue that one scene where the guy stabs him and he goes you bled me fucker right. that was amazing <laughs> fucker just seems so out of place it, it, he sounded like a like a teenager that just learned how to cuss 
That was some of the dialogue issues. Yeah. Uh, See, I didn't have dialogue issues. I think that was that's... a very real response to getting blood. Blood me, <laughs> fucker. But, but, but fucker in that scenario, like it, it just seems like a like a teenager that'll go home and play Halo and drink Mountain Dew and call people fucker. Well, I think it's a. I think hey, what look, it's showing you is, like Halo. <laughs> is that it's establishing that this is a guy that has not been injured much in battle. Yeah, and the fact that somebody was actually able to injure him pissed him off. Yeah, but when I think about barbarian esque uh curses. Like son of the word, Lord. Yeah, the, the word fucker. Like to me that was like I thought Garthinus in that moment. I was like, oh this is what it would be like Absolutely. if yeah, this is what it would be yes. like if Garthinus wrote yeah. a barbarian story. Like, and what would be wrong <laughs> with zero, that? Zero things. Nothing I'm not saying anything would be wrong with that. I'm saying it felt weird for a Jeff Lemire book to have yeah, that right. considering what he was doing, the work he was doing in the story. And then the and then the sorcerer guy that curses him or says, you know, you're bleeding is just the beginning of it or yeah. something like that you know i mean yeah it, you should have there's some great shit no, obviously you're you're that. staying on the book right? oh, I'm, yeah i'm on the book <laughs> yeah. yeah sean you think you're gonna stick with it yeah i'm gonna have you uh put me on my pull list rock and fucking roll yeah. um yeah no it's, matt are you staying on it yeah i mean it, jeff Lem- it's jeff lemire so i'm gonna i'm gonna stay on it because it's him and i'm you know it's like i said God, from the i beginning. hope i'm not wrong yeah <laughs> oh, <my laughs> mark, mark this day craig because at issue five, it's going to be a round table again. Oh, probably should be. <laughs> we can make we can make that happen. Definitely. I, I honestly think at the end of the first story arc, we should come back to I this. I don't think it's a matter of being right or it, wrong. It depends though. on how good the X-Men Unless book Craig that comes is wrong, out that week is. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I mean, I mean, if he's gonna if he's gonna read books with, with calling me uh, finding out how I'm wrong in mind, fair. Uh, but I, I, I really don't think it's a matter of being right or wrong though, because I also don't think there's anything wrong with yeah. Jeff Lemire writing just an average fun hack and slash I agree. barbarian story. And if that's what we're getting, I'm still gonna be satisfied with it. In comparison with some of his other work, though, it's not gonna be something that I like. One thousand percent, it's not going to be to, a hack and slash fantasy. Yeah. No. He's going to get an M16, so what's going to happen? That'd be fucking... Yeah. Well, he's got he's to protect himself against the 32 to 50 feral hogs. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Real life crossover. Well, sweet. So go go check that book out. Your local comic shop may have some extra issues. If they don't, get them to order it for you or drive around, see if you can find it. You can always buy it off digital as long as you pay for it. That's all that really matters. But I... So I'm, I'm curious. In the, oh, go ahead, buddy. Can I go first in the books? Are you still going to read books about how I'm wrong? Oh. No, I'm joking. He's like, oh, dang. <laughs> no, of course you can. Okay. Um, so, Craig, why don't you tell us a book that you have read in the past few past few weeks that you dug? I read a book about a guy that's in a fantasy world that comes to the modern world. <laughs> oh, yeah? Are you reading Exo Man of War? No, it's Knights Temporal Number 1. Oh, yeah. By uh, Aftershock Comics with Colin Budd and Fran Galen. So this book starts off and uh, you have a small group of men on horseback chasing a man into a forest and that is rumored to be haunted. The man they are chasing is Gaspard the Sorcerer and Augusta refuses to stop at the border of the forest even one of his, when one of his companions is killed. He runs into the forest and is transported to a modern city but he, <clears throat> but he isn't even phased by the fact that everything is different. A man recognizes him as he runs by and a woman yells for him to go this way because the sorcerer had ran that way. And he responds to that woman by name of Jane. Mm-hmm. And so Gaspard gets away and Auguste is immediately teleported back to the forest where he meets a woman sitting in the tree that he doesn't recognize as the same woman he just saw in the city and ask her a name. And she tells him that it's uh, Jane the, fa- uh, the Fool. And uh, she then takes him on a trip back to the modern city, which we find out is New York City. And the man that had recognized him before is standing there and starts to have a conversation and tells him, hey, 50 years ago you were here and you saved my life. And Auguste has no memory of these events. And about at that moment, he's attacked by Gaspard's minions And uh, during the battle, the old man that he had saved previously gets stabbed and is is dying. And uh, Jane draws a knife from behind her back and tells him that the modern world is tricky. So, And that's where the book ends. So you don't know she's about to stab him or what. And you really don't know what's going on because it kind of jumps back and forth in this story. It's like she, she also calls him by August when they're in New York instead of August. So it's like this. Well, I wasn't going to. 
like ruin your your train that you were on there because you were saying anything on. But when you say Auguste, can you please say it in a French accent? No, please. I know. Pretty please. I I, I don't speak French. <laughs> Auguste. They, they, see, you did it. You can do it. Ew. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, it, it's it's a very very good setup story. Uh, but you know, apparently, I like these stories because mm-hmm. I like the one we just talked about, and you guys didn't like it as much as me. But uh, this guy, we find out that uh, throughout the story that he was actually a crusader and he's trying to earn his soul back. And at one point she tells him, you can't earn your soul by hacking it f- from the corpse of others. Oh, so, I disagree. Yeah, I, I disagree <laughs> with her too, but she also tries to stab him you know, or potentially at the end of the book. So evidently she's not right about a great many things. Uh, the art on this is, is really good. Uh, Fran uh, Galen is covering all the art on it. He's doing the colors, pencils, inks, and uh, the color paddle, uh, palette in this is uh, totally great for this book. Y- as you're going through it, you just see the, the pages just match exactly what's going on in the book. When they're in the city, it's, it's brighter colors. When they're in the forest, darker colors. He, he really does a good job with the colors on this book. And some of the pages in this book are absolutely brilliant. Some of them are yeah. so-so, but some are just brilliant. Uh, for me, Bund does it again. Uh, one issue in, and he has me drawn into this world. And I feel like I just repeated myself because two weeks ago he I did Unearthed, which he helped co-write. But again, he sets the pace at this, at this frantic. I mean, how long did it take me to do my synopsis yeah, two minutes quick because that's how quick the pace of this mm-hmm. book is. It just starts and it rolls and it's set up like most modern action movies are set up where in this story, you get everything going on while they're doing battle. You know, you, you get the what's happening in the story, what's going on yeah. all while they're in the middle of this battle or while they're fighting. Or you might have a little moment where they stop and talk for a second, but then a battle starts. Right. You know? So it just it, it rolls and I'm it's five of five stars for me. I'm in on this book. It, it's funny because you said that maybe maybe we just don't like these stories and you do. I read this as well, and it's, it, this is not the strongest I feel that Cullen has ever been. So it's just it's right in there with exactly what you just said. It's I, just I, I think it's what it's a preference and type of stories. Yeah. I did so, enjoy it though, and I think, I, I, I think it's the, the reverse of what I'm used to in fantasy, which is you take the modern person and put them in the fantasy world. Yeah. yeah. I kind of like this pulling the fantasy person out and put them. And this isn't really a fantasy. It's uh, this is a, a, a crusader. You know, mm-hmm. this is somebody medieval times night type person that's brought to modern world. Yeah. So, and uh, it's a time travel story too. And I think that's essentially. That's, yeah, but that's I don't love time of... travel, but I kind of like this kind yeah, of time that, travel, yeah. where it's pull them out of this and put them mm-hmm. in this, as opposed to time traveling to change the past type stuff. This might be a deep pull, but I swear there was a Jean Reno movie in like the '90s where he was like a Templar brought in the modern Manhattan. <laughs> I don't, I'm not aware. Not Sean, sure. are you thinking of Highlander? I'm always thinking of Highlander. <laughs> this is a different though. Yeah, but there, there can only be one Highlander. <laughs> yeah. Facts. Um, I'm so sorry. I did that. Um, <laughs> no, no dude, good. I think you're right. I'm, I can't remember what it was called, but there was very much a... I'm, I'm, I'll Google it later. <laughs> well, it and there time was... Time Cop? Or are you thinking of Time everything Cop? Everything is also Time Cop. It was the first comic book movie ever made. You heard that, right? <laughs> that was the reverse of that, where they took a modern person, and it was like somebody in King Arthur's court. It was like a kitty. Well, they did that, kid, they did that and... one, too. By... I'm going to look up his that movie, movie with uh, Martin Lawrence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Issa K is the best Oh, genre. my God. <laughs> I no, him. so I, I honestly think that it's, a, it's what you like in a story. Yeah. And I think that's possibly why the other book didn't hit with you guys as well. Fair enough, and it very well could be. And the good thing with Cullen, Cullen writes so much that you can, <laughs> if you don't like it, wait five minutes and we'll tell you well, about a book that you're going to like. The pace on, pacing on this book is what kind of drew yeah. me in. It, everything happened just at breakneck speed through this book, and that's not a bad thing when you're reading an action book. Or you're reading. Yeah, and, and to that, I also think there's some merit to the, the mindset that you're in when you read. So I went through... Well, last week oh, I had a couple absolutely of, that's yeah true. I had a couple of bad days last week, and so I went through and I I did not enjoy anything that I read. Yeah, I thought everything that I read was 
like literally was pissing me off. And so I had to take a step back and be like, okay, is it because the stories are pissing me off or is because I'm pissed off reading the stories? I think it was the latter. I went and re reread a bunch of those books. Like most of them I felt the same way about. The rest, like there were a few that I was like, oh no, I missed a lot of good. That was still happened this. last week. He borrowed that Strawberry Shortcake comic from Craig. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, sharing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Daredevil did that to me. I read Daredevil and then walked away from comics for about two days. Oh, uh, well, it, yeah. <laughs> because not, I, I knew I wasn't in the mood to read anymore. You want a fun You want a fun conversation about that, you should go to our Facebook page. For sure. Um, that that was not the book. The so book get is, Knights Temporal. Yeah, do that. <laughs> Sean, what'd you read this week, man? Uh, this week I read <laughs> Runaways, number 23, of, uh, published by Marvel Comics, written by Rainbow Rowell, art by Andreas Genelot. Colored by Matthew Wilson, Doom dialogue specifically <laughs> lettered by Nico Henrichen, mm -hmm. Henriken, with normal letters by VCs Joe Caramagna. Uh, this issue deals a lot with the relationships between the members of the Runaways, which I think is the strong suit of this specific run, which I think is what helped lead it to his Eisner nomination that I had for this year. Uh, it starts off with uh, Victor and Doombot are kind of running a diagnosis on each other, so he's kind of been put into a sleep mode while they're trying to figure out what the fuck is wrong with him. Because if if you know anything about what's been going on in the series, like it's been, a big part of it has been that the fact that they found out Victor has Doombot kind of parts into his cyborg body. Okay. So that that's kind of like a big issue with them. While he's doing that, we get some internal dialogue between him and Doombot. And if you read anything with Doombot, it's fucking amazing. Yes. Yeah. He hates Victor, but he's also like best friends with Victor. And Doombot will destroy Victor, but he won't. Yeah. But it's been real, like the dime between them. Are they married? Damn near. <laughs> like, like, like cyber marriage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Robots in their marriages. Robots. Ro robot marriage. Uh, while that's kind of going on during uh, his programming, we get a lot between uh, Gert and Chase finally sitting down with like dealing with their former relationship because Gert died. Mm -hmm. years ago in continuity like i think it's been close to 10 years since when she died early on in the runaway story and they were in a relationship he has since brought her back but she's still i believe it's like 16 and now he's growing up to he's like in his mid-20s yeah and now it's it's awkward because that feelings are still there but they're also like it's completely different mindsets chase has been in battles and you know helped out nico when she was in the avengers like you know they've they've grown apart and it's been awkward since Gert came back because he still has those feelings, but he also realized now it's like a damn near a 10 year age gap. Yeah. And, and Gert has, like, you know, see that her mindset from 10 years ago doesn't even fit in. So she's trying to find herself. She'd start a relationship with Victor. So, like, and they get into that and getting deep into, like, Chase, who's kind of the, while a tech genius, he's kind of the dumb jock. Mm hmm. And it kind of gets into him does not feel, he's like, like Gert, he's, he said Gert was always going to leave him for somebody smarter. You know what I mean? And it really showed a, an emotional level of Chase, which I don't think we've seen in this series. So we get, dive into that. We also get into Nico and uh, Carolina's uh, recent relationship that they realized that they started being a couple. And Carolina's sneaking out doing superhero and stuff, which if you know the Runaways, they ain't about all that costuming stuff, despite Nico being in the Avengers. But that's right. kind of like when they're together, they're like, you know, we're low key. We're not out there being superheroes. So you get into that kind of like, you get the trust issue, but they also bring them closer together. And it's just like this... It's a, it's a dialogue heavy issue, which this whole run actually has been, I would say, definitely more character introspectives and the relationship of the dynamic of the family more so than an action book. And I, and that, I think that's a big part of why I feel like this has probably been the best run since Brian came on started the mm -hmm. series. It's this a, like, if you've been on and off or if you know a little about the Runaways, I would not going to say it's a great jumping on point, but it would be a good one to get into the characters to, to kind of really learn about the team. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's, I said, not going to read the whole book. But, like, that's kind of the general synopsis of what's going on with this is everyone kind of dealing with where they are right now, the team, and how they working together. So, Can we talk about how badass of a name Rainbow Rails has? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like, your name is fucking Rainbow? <laughs> are you kidding me? That's I, <laughs> fucking parents, awesome. Parents are definitely hippies. <laughs> so I want to uh, touch on this a little bit right. because uh, Runaways is one of those books that when you, when you step into a series after Brian K. Vaughn's written mm -hmm. it, you're you're stepping into big shoes. Absolutely. And, and I had my trepidation on this because there's been some very mediocre runaway stories since Brian K. Vaughn left. This one has been really good and has yeah. the same feel yeah. as the Brian K. Vaughn runaways. Now it doesn't have, in my opinion, the emotional depth, but very few people can hit those emo emotional levels that right. Brian K. Vaughn can. Mm -hmm. But it's still hitting 
really good emotionally. Yeah. Don't get right. me wrong. It's not missing. It's just, you know, it, Brian K. Vaughn's a 10. This is a 9. Yeah. You know, it, it's hitting all of the stuff it should hit for a runaway story. Yeah, well, it's really taken because, like, Brian K. Vaughn's story, which very much as a title of Runaways, was a lot of that was dealing with the parent-child dynamic. Yes. You know, and that hit very hard, and especially, like, you know, when you got into the character, it was very well written. And while even writers like Joss Whedon came in afterwards, it didn't quite hit as good as Brian K. Vaughn. But Rowell has hit, and especially in, these here, in here recently, since it finally got the team together over the course of these last 23 issues, and now it's kind of working back into the, the personal dynamics between them, I think, is really hitting hard again. Because, like I said, some of them are a couple, some of them are former, you know, and it's still like with Alex coming back in the recent issues, you know, that through the team in the loop. It's just been very, uh, this is a very good character study into the mind of people who are now young adults. They're not even like teenagers anymore, except for like Gert and Molly. Did did BKV intend for Runaways to be an ongoing? I mean, so I've read, I've read Brian K. Vaughn's original Runaways yeah. and where he ended it. I mean, he obviously left it open to the point that you could, but he also ended it in a way, ended it in the way that I think that maybe he had it in his mind. Like this was going to be kind of a one done 12 issue series. Um, <laughs> was it twelve issues or could he go? I think it was a little bit more than that. Like yeah. maybe because like I, I got him, I got him in the collected yeah. like yeah, manga esque volumes. Yeah. So I had I have those. Yeah. Uh, I I do feel like he wrote it one and done yeah. with, but I think he because it's Marvel. Right. He, he didn't end it to where like they can never be worked with again. No, because sure. I think he knew someone else, but I don't think he ever want he ever intended to come back. I think well, he told his story. Uh, it, but what's been great about this story is that uh, they've stepped in and they're picking up pieces mm -hmm. that bkv left you know he, they're they're dealing with the emotional baggage that these kids would have had yeah. 10 years down the road or whatever it is i yeah. forget how far down the road it is um but and they're doing a very good job of that so yeah even though you can read the brian k vaughn stuff and never pick up another mm -hmm. runaways book again and you'll be perfectly happy and you'll be thankful that you read that book trust me go read it if you haven't read it but this is doing a great job of yeah. uh, sometimes when somebody else comes in and, and picks up something that somebody else worked on, it's not real good. Yeah. I'm not loving the Sandman stuff that's happening right now. And part of that's because it's not Gil Ma Neil Gaiman writing it. Yeah. It's not that it's bad stuff. It's just that it's not doing it for me because I'm expecting Neil Gaiman level of Sandman stuff when it has that title on it. So, yeah. you know, in this case, they're actually accomplishing it. And I think Absolutely. in the world of, you know, the world that we live in now to where there's not that many ongoings to where when a creative team ends their run and the book ends and it resets at a new number one or whatever, I think we forget about what it's like when, you know, you have a really good team lead up to a certain point to issue, say, 26. And on issue 27, you get new writers, new art. And just an entire new package, but it continues with that story. I think we forget about that transference, uh, like you know, because they rarely do it. Well, and you were talking about you know, you mentioned Daredevil earlier. Um, Anne Nascenti wrote a fantastic Daredevil run. Anne Nascenti wrote one of my favorite Daredevil runs. And Nascenti's issue and the problem that she had is she started writing it literally right after Frank Miller got yeah. off the book. People forget about Anne Nascenti's run, right? Because they pay so much attention to Frank Miller's, and because she's obviously not Frank Miller. Right. She's still like it's, the run's still great. So when you get stuff like this and you get like Rainbow Rowell, um, I mean, there's a bit of a time gap there. But, you know, picking up the toys that yeah. that BKV left, you know, I, I, it's 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 interesting to me that we compare that the way we do today. Mm -hmm. Well, and like you said, there have been writers in between. Like I said, Joss Whedon wrote one, a, a short arc, and I'm forgetting the name of the person who wrote the last one before Rainbow took over. Well, that one was a... Uh... Had that was a tie in to the Secret War stuff. I well, think, no, that was that, but oh, it was okay. also a, a, an ongoing one that got cut short. I think oh, okay. it got canceled after a few issues. Um, I mainly remember it because Humberto Ramos was on pencils and his, I loved his art style with Runaways. But Rainbow has picked up exactly like with the baggage that BKV had started. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said, we got Alex returning, we got you know, Gert's death, all that stuff happened in his run. And while they're not necessarily ignoring the other two, they They're pretty much ignoring the other two. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. And, and there's not much <laughs> reference to the other two. There series. is, I, yeah. which is sad because I still like, uh, I say I like her, now I'm going to go blank on her name, Rose, I think the girl from the Joss Whedon time travel story. But like I said, they have, like I said, but it is picking up exactly where BKV had dropped, and it's it's been a phenomenal series. I highly recommend picking it up. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I, I second that, pick it up. 
You want to go next, Matt? Sure. Are you going to tell us a story about a uh, time-traveling uh, barbarian? I am not. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you can just see the incredulous smile. Oh, <laughs> rubbing my hands together to talk about this story. SFG fam, take a seat. I'm going to tell you a story. It happens back. This, this story came out in 2005. All right. So we're going back to 2005. This is a Garth Ennis story. With Louis LaRosa on pencils and Scott Koblish on colors. R- raise, is, your, raise your hand if you know what he's going to say. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is a one shot called The Punisher, The Cell. I'm so shocked that you like a Garth Ennis book. <laughs> this Punisher book came out back in the in the middle of the um, the Punisher, the Max series. Started out <clears throat> called Punisher in the beginning. A lot of people, when you refer to this, they confuse the Marvel Knights, Scarth Ennis stuff that had a lot of comedy. This is when he totally reset and he just did straight, you know, hardcore crime, violent stories and very little humor in it whatsoever, especially from the Punisher. Right. Um, unlike what he did before. It's interesting, real quick on that note, he has publicly said he would like to disown himself from 90% of the previous Punisher stories. Hmm. And when he did this, the setting is Rikers Island federal prison. And in a cell deep in the heart of the prison, there are five mafia members, three soldiers, the top advisor and the Godfather. They enjoy freedoms and privileges like no others in custody due to their control of the guards through gambling debts and uh, threats of violence outside the prison walls. Open with, Frank being escorted down the main corridor of the prison. It's revealed that he recently walked into a New York police station and confessed to a string of murders. He is, of course, handcuffed and flanked by four prison officers. The prisoners are in an uproar as they see him walking down the corridor and yell threats of violence. The chief guard is talking in Frank's ear, letting him know his chances. They come upon a huge inmate leaning against the wall, making kissing gestures at Frank. The chief guard lets him know that this is the most dangerous man in the prison, and he's coming for him. Frank, without hesitation, elbows one guard viciously in the nose, steals the chief guard's baton before he can react, and smashes it down above the right eye of the inmate, bringing him to his knees. He then quickly delivers a second blow across the back of his neck, crippling the man. He then calmly turns to the remaining guards and says, Send your next most dangerous. (laughs) <laughs> you gotta love frank castle so <clears throat> the chief guard reports this to the five mafioso ma- mafioso because everybody in the in the prison essentially works for the mob uh they're either on the take or they're being held ransom by their own gambling debts one or the other uh he lets the mafia the godfather know that frank is now in solitary um, after this act, he was subdued, beaten, and thrown in, in solitary and stripped. The act of aggression threatens the perception of the mafia's dominance in the prison. So the Godfather makes plans to respond. Frank knows the politics of the prison because while he was free, he targeted recently paroled Riker inmates for information uh, prior to murdering them. <laughs> of course. <laughs> As you do. Wait, is this is this low key the story of how Jeffrey Epstein got suicided? <laughs> oh. <laughs> is that what is that what topical bottom bean? <laughs> so he's moved from solitary to general population. That explains it. Frank Castle did it. <laughs> yeah. uh, knowing he's moved from from solitary to general population, knowing he's of course target for murder. Uh, once he's in his standard two bunk cell, he quickly murders his cellmate and switches bunks. <laughs> As expected, during the night, the three mafia soldiers come to his cell, order who they think is the cellmate out of the cell, and begin to viciously stab what they think is Frank Castle, but is, of course, the corpse. Uh, as, As he slips out of the cell, the internal dialogue reads, My head goes light. The temptation to kill them is almost overwhelming. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know why his head went light? Because he got an erection and all the blood ran from his head to his Murder penis. 
So through a series of moves, Frank instigates hostilities between the black and the neo-Nazi inmates. <laughs> Jesus. The, guard, the guards know that he's somehow responsible, so he is again beaten, stripped, and thrown in solitary. As the hostilities boil over into a full-blown riot, Frank is to be released from solitary via the mob boss's order. Uh, but upon release, he manages to subdue the chief guard, steal his gun, and don his uniform. As he moves throughout the prison, he is fighting the temptation to mow them all down, he says. But he's got to move quickly during this riot to do what he wants to do. So the mafia bosses now believe that the Punisher is coming for them. So they decide to leave the cell and relocate. As they're walking down the corridor, they come upon an inmate. He is on his knees, he is sobbing, and he's got his hands interlocked between his, uh, behind his head. You know, like you're assuming the position. That's how I assume it. Yeah. <laughs> With tears. Yeah. <laughs> the inmate simply says, he says you have to turn back. Right then, his head explodes from an unseen gunshot. Jesus. So the mafia settles back into their cell. <laughs> of course. And they begin to panic. <laughs> so they can't figure out why the Punisher has gone, to, has gone to such lengths. They begin to confess to the most horrible crimes they have committed Assuming that these are the reasons that the Punisher is after them. But the Don tells them they're idiots. This is somehow personal. Enter Frank Castle to the cell. He immediately shoots the three soldiers in the knees. One of them begins to scream at him that all the things that Frank has done, he is no better than them. As Frank closes the cell door behind him, he says calmly, there is nothing I wouldn't do to get this time with you. And can you imagine the terror in these men's minds right now? <laughs> so he then recounts, Frank then recounts the story to the top advisor about a mafia shootout in a park. This was a power move. The advisor instigated against his Don that he was serving at the time. Frank also knows that the soldiers present in the cell were amongst the shooters that day. I'm going to start the killing now, he calmly says. <laughs> he grabs a large kitchen knife from the stack of cooking utensils in the cell. He tells one soldier how he first shot his daughter. The soldier first shot his daughter in the stomach as he plunges the knife into his gut and opens it up. I need an adult. <laughs> he then tells... He then tells the hug. <laughs> he then tells him that the second shot hit his daughter in the heart as he plunges the blade into the inmate's chest. He turns to the other two soldiers and tells them, "You shot my five-year-old son in the head. When I picked him up, his brains came out into my hands." He then calmly draws a police baton and says, "Do you understand what it is I'm telling you?" <laughs> Frank then bashes the two men's brains out with the baton. While doing so, the old Don is choking the top advisor to death because he has just learned that shootout only happened because that top advisor was trying to take over the family. But upon killing the top advisor, the Don suffers a, is suffering a heart attack. So as he is dying, Frank stands over him, telling him that he will continue to kill as many criminals as he can, quote, until you and your kind are gone from the world. That's the end of the book. I'm really hoping Jerry has a cancer child story to tell us next. <laughs> Look, there, there is no one who has historically written Garth, or who uh, written the Punisher the way that Garth has. No, no one, I don't think anyone understands that character better than Garthiness. Um, and there hasn't been anyone portray him in the manner that he should be portrayed since he got off the book. There's been people who try. But there's been no one who's been nearly successful. I mean, I've got, like, I got goosebumps when you were reading that, just from those moments. But there's also nothing about what you just read that, that reads as if Frank is a hero. Like, he's he's not. Uh, you, you can't hear what you just said and not go, oh, fuck, this guy's not fit mentally to, to do anything um, but, but this. And that's what Garthiness does the best. He gives you a story. He's get... Garthiness does this whole thing where he can put you in the saddle of a serial killer and make you side with him. And in doing so, fuck with you. <laughs> like, fuck with you as the reader. Um, that's just, it's just, wow. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the line, there is nothing I wouldn't do to get this time with you. Uh, that was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> well, it's, I just can't imagine the fear that that instilled in, in those five men's minds at that very moment. Uh, He's closing the cell door behind him as he delivers that line. Yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> this, you know, the, uh, what I really, of course, you know, Garth Ennis did such a great job as um, writing the character and his motivations and there's one line in in this Max series where somebody is doing something that is going to bring the ire of Frank Castle, and one of Frank Castle's old war buddies tells him, "He, you know, what you don't understand is he's the most dangerous man on earth." And that's really how to write Frank Castle. He is just—he's not a man. He's not super powered, but he is the most dangerous man on earth. And that is the way. Whenever he is written that way, it's. Um, are you saying that he can get his soul back from carving it from corpses? Oh, <laughs> God damn it. Can he? Or is He's, his soul that's gone? That's why it said man. <laughs> yeah. No, his soul is gone. Frank Castle, and that's the thing. Frank Castle, when, you know, and that's what bugs me when, you know, versus what Garth Ennis, because I've been waiting, when I started reading this story, these stories, this Mac story, honestly, I thought to myself, I've been waiting for this Punisher story since I was 12 years old. And I realized they were not appropriate for a 12 year old, <laughs> but I've liked the Punisher ever since I was a kid, but I never, the stories that he was in, the way it was written, I knew there was something wrong with them. I knew every one of them. I was like, there's something wrong here. This right. does, this is not, when I read these, I was like, this is exactly the way this should be. Um, you know, he's, he's a, he's the human equivalent of a shark is basically what he is. And it's it's simple. He's not complicated. He's not crying over his family anymore. Yeah, I mean, and and I think that unfortunately, so many people try to write him now that he is still yeah yeah in this PTSD over his children. Yeah. No, he's moved on. He yeah. over his family. He's he's moved on. He's just yeah. killing for the sake of killing yeah. for because they're mm-hmm. bad people that don't need to exist. Yeah. When it you know that when it says little things like my head goes light with the temptation to to kill. Them. I mean that's. Amazing. Well, it is. It's a and psycho. It's, it's the same thing with the whole. Uh, there's nothing I wouldn't do to spend this time with you. That's a psychosexual connection to yeah. what he's doing that's being displayed. It's the same thing with the Joker and Batman. Right. Um, when when the Joker is written well and written right, the Joker has a psycho psych, psychosexual connection to, to Batman. It's the same thing between Frank and murder. <laughs> Killing is a release. Killing murderers is a release. Right. Which, yeah. if you do any sort of. Uh, uh, reading or studying of serial killers Mm -hmm. them killing Mm -hmm. is their release the way that sex is a release for yeah for non serial killers for people with normal functioning brains that's you know we have released through sex and through relationships they have it through killing people just because they exist yeah yeah Yeah, he's not you know and that again He's not avenging his family every time he goes out into the streets, and that's why people ride him so much. Yeah. Um, Jerry, do you have an uplifting tale for no. us? No. <laughs> Shit. I don't. Uh, the book that I actually read this week was... Um, it's a kid in cancer ward, by isn't it? Donny Cates, um, <laughs> illustrated by Dylan Burnett, colorist D. Cunifee, uh letterer Taylor Esposito, a uh, story by Seamus Martin and logo designed by Brian Medina. Um, it's a trade paperback called Interceptor. Uh, they came out with the first issue of it on Free Comic Book Day. And then basically, or I guess they're going to do a three-part OGN series for it. Um, the story picks up in the future. All of humanity lives in a utopian society on a planet called Palace. Uh, a new president is elected and his cabinet members have a presidential secret that they have to tell him. Uh, so the majority of the population believes that humanity fled to the stars because Earth became uninhabitable due to population senseless war. Uh, in actuality, it came under attack by vampires, and humanity was losing the fight against them. So what they did is they built these giant arc-like ships, took all of humanity to flee Earth, and detonated all of the nuclear weapons that were on the planet to try to deal with the problem. Um, But instead what happened is the vampires got stronger and smarter. Um, Recently a ship was found on the outskirts of uh, a city in Palace um, that there were vampires in. So they dispatched those vampires quickly before the public, general public could uh, find out. And then they sent out their 
their own, you know, ship to intercept them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was one single soldier that has been trained for decades uh, named uh, Sergeant Polly Lahan. Um, she lands lands on Earth. Uh, she immediately gets swarmed by these enemies that we're led to believe are vampires. We really find out that they are, are lesser. Uh, she's still in hypersleep when a um, uh, person is seen driving a motorcycle, zigzagging through all the laser beams coming from her ship. Uh, and then they jump as soon as this ship opens up and she snatches them out of midair and it ends up being a human. And there aren't supposed to be any more humans left on Earth. They were all supposed to go to the stars and apparently it was a government secret that they were keeping. Um, the the child's name is Weep, and she essentially tells Lahan that we need to get out of here um, because the real vampires are coming. Apparently, these things that are around them are called ticks, and when they explode, they excrete a pheromone that attracts vampires. And it's at that point that we see that the vampires are organized and have tech and helicopters, and they essentially land and capture Weep and, and Lahan. We get to uh, prison and they're they're talking and Lahan's just, you know, essentially telling about the uh, the plan and how there's more humans on this uh, this other planet. And uh, suddenly their uh, Weep says, you know, mentioned something about her father will come to, to save them and something. At that point, of the power goes out, and all of the gel cells start opening. Oh shit! Lahan's trying to, you know, coach Weep through how to combat a vampire. That they have the same weak spots <laughs> as a human, and Weep is just like, "Well, here's a better idea. You know, aim for the aim for the heart. Stay low. For God's sake, don't bleed." <laughs> so they start going through these droves of vampire uh, prisoners that just escaped. Uh, meanwhile, we see outside it's Weep's father uh, with his. Uh, Weeps two older sisters that are twins and a whole mess of uh, resistance soldiers that have come to save her. And they're just causing absolute chaos. Lahan ends up getting injured in the process and is bleeding. And all these vampires are about to swarm him. And the uh, the two older twin sisters jump in and save him at the last moment. Um, the, in the meantime, after that, uh, all we get are brief images of what uh, Lahan sees as she's past trying to keep consciousness and they're escaping the city full of vampires um we uh we get back to the resistance hq and uh lahan finds out that it's you know basically just weak people that are injured and children they cut over to a her ship and we see a vampire trying to break into it with a crowbar. We then find out that he was the one that brought them in. He was a sheriff. His name is is Arden, which, uh, spoiler alert, this series is actually the future of Redneck. Um, Donny Cates just announced it this week on Twitter, and this character, Arden, is a, a child in that story. So this mm-hmm. is their future. I saw that tweet. He can't get into the ship. It's... All of its uh, offensive weaponry and stuff starts to attack him. He loses an arm in the process, so he decides to hatch up another plan. Goes to the Resistance looking for Lahan, and he pretty much just, you know, tells him, like, hey, I want to, um, I want you to help me out here. Uh, he then says that um, uh, it was him that opened the, their doors to the prison, uh, and that he can help get all the humans off the planet in exchange for helping him take the throne. Uh, he then tells them about uh, the king in the old country, Luke, uh, who didn't have much use for his younger sister, Matilda, so he shipped her off to play monarch in the City of the Dead, where they just came from. She, So Matilda hatched a plan to make humans pay so her brother would notice her um, by destroying all the humans on Palace and just basically wiping out what was remaining of humanity. Um, but because of this, she's been burning through their resources and if she keeps it up, neither species will survive over all of the war and, you know, humans are just going to keep nuking vampires and vampires are just going to keep killing. As people tend to do when they're at a war. Right. <laughs> just right. keep nuking each uh, other. So he <laughs> now needs... you have nuclear powered vampires. <laughs> <laughs> so he needs, he needs their help at, um, taking Matilda out so he could take the throne and then they can take the ships and get out. Uh, we then get a great montage of the the ship that Lehan has is actually a mech suit that's armed to the teeth. Um, and we get 
a monologue of her sending her last transmission back to Earth. And it takes some time because it took like a year for, for her to even get there in the fa- uh, first place. And she's just mowing through fields and fields of zombies through this city. When she gets to Matilda and is completely stopped in her tracks because Matilda's, you know, like this god level vampire and she, Matilda just starts making short work of her and pummeling her. Uh, looks like all is lost and Matilda is about to kill Lahan when Lahan mentions that if she takes all her ships to palace, they will be destroyed before they even enter the planet's atmosphere. Uh, that's when we see Matilda has this confused look on her face um, and says that she doesn't have any ships and that she doesn't know what she's talking about at all. And apparently Lahan has been betrayed by someone and right before Matilda can tell her that they have a common enemy, her head gets cut in half <laughs> and Arden pops up behind her. <laughs> he gets cut in half? <laughs> in half and half. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Horizontally in yeah. half. Hot dog, yeah. not hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's when Arden pops up. Uh, I, yeah, I think it, Matt he, just got an erection over there. <laughs> he, cuts her head in half. he then reveals that it was he who sent the scouts to her planet and he had to get Matilda out of the way before he could move forward with his plan to conquer Palace. Uh, as he's monologuing, uh, Weep pops up and shoots him with the uh, the pheromone that uh, they were taking from the ticks. And then Lehan kicks him out of the window, and all of a sudden he gets swarmed by all these other monsters. Nuclear he's, vampires. Yeah. <laughs> which you actually find out that the ticks are made from drinking the blood of the radiated humans, and that's they mutate into these mindless little monsters. Arden lands on the <laughs> ground. He's He's fighting them back. And I mean, you know, he's this like ridiculously powerful vampire, so he's having no trouble. And he he says, "You'll have to do better than that." Uh, when suddenly the mech suit lands in front of him, you know what's left of. I think it's like missing an arm, and it ends up being Weep. And she just picks him up and flies him up above the clouds, and the sun is just shining at the top, and just he disintegrates instantly. The uh, the rest of the wrap up is the king of the vampires finding out that his sister was killed. And Earth getting um, uh, Lehan's last transmission and them deciding that they're going to send an entire assault force to finish the job that the nukes did not have. Wow. So, I'm waiting for Nold to show up. In it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so we get this, uh, this, this whole thing of like, you know, the king of the vampires uh, that's, you know, going to be this huge force that we're going to have to deal with. And then like the uh, people on Palace, the government and everything, that knew all along that humans were here but never Mm -hmm. sent any kind of help or anything. They didn't even tell Lahan about it. And they don't even care that they're going to wipe out all these people on the planet. So then you have Lahan and all of her people that have just saved the city from its tyrants that are going to have to figure out what to do between these two forces. Yeah, I I love the idea of Donny Cates making a broader universe out of this. Especially, like, I love Redneck. Well, I'm just wondering how some vampires in Texas have turned into this. (laughs) They can't even get along with each other, let alone. In in his whole scene where he's, because he had somehow gotten this ship to this giant, I don't know, aircraft carrier, and inside of it, it shows all these, like, memorabilia and stuff, and it's got, like, a Texan flag and, mm-hmm. like, all these, like, cavalry swords and stuff like that. <laughs> like, it's, it's pretty pretty great. The, the, the art was fantastic. Of course, every scene that you saw on Palace was nice and clean and pretty. Um, whereas, you know, whenever you see the earth and everything, it's just grimy and dirty and, and dark. Um, and then it was kind of cool to have the scenes with the mech in that because the mech represents, you know, all the cleanness and everything of Palace and it's all white and blue and bright and she's just mowing down all this darkness and everything like that. It's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. It was it was a it was a great little little read. I really wish quick read. I wish they had have let us know that it was going to I mean I know it would have spoiled some things, mm-hmm. but I wish they had have known that it was going to be a part of what the Redneck universe yeah. is doing because I would have bought it if mm-hmm. that was the case. Yeah, I'm gonna see if you can order me one yeah. today. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, fantastic. Donnie Cates. Doing it again. Mm-hmm. Well, all right. I guess it's my turn. Yeah, talk well, about a book. Craig, you opened it up with a Cullen Bun book. So this wouldn't be the SFT podcast if I didn't just naturally and completely not on purpose close <laughs> us with a Cullen Bun book. Awesome. Um, so 
a few if, a few years back. Is uh, it about a knight that goes to it is not, modern times? Okay. It is not, but there is some some weirdness happening. Uh, for several years, if you have asked me, and people did, what my favorite book coming out was, it was Harrow County. Uh, it, it, it's this amazing book done by done by Colin Bunn, uh, beautifully beautifully painted by Tyler Crook. And when that book ended, um, I felt loss. I grieved. <laughs> I grieved for that partnership. And finally, finally, I was I was so ecstatic when I found out that those two were teaming up on something again. And and the book that they're teaming up on is called Manor Black. It's it's written by Colin Bunn with the help of Brian Hurt. And then again, gorgeously, gorgeously painted by Mr. Tyler Crook. He's got an excellent, excellent use of watercolors. It's just, I can't sing this man's praises enough. Well, what the book is, this is, as most things that Cullen writes, it's a little bit horror. It's a little bit, it's just a lot of things. Um, the book opens up kind of in media res, like action is taking place, and there's this van packed full of people. Uh, there's five of them. One of them, they're hurt, and they're running for something, uh, running from something. They, You don't know what's chasing them, but, they, I mean, these people, like, you can just see it and and the way Tyler draws them, they pure fear, pure terror, uh, and they they keep saying that we've got to go because we've got to protect the totem. Um, again, we don't know what the totem is. We don't have a clue. Then this this kind of uh, this guy, they see this guy in the middle of a road that they're on, and he, his face is like wrapped up in gauze, like looks kind of like a mummy. And they they swerve to avoid him. I, like this was one of the creatures they were running from. It's also the creature that is painted on the, the cover of the, the issue and so you know they, they veer off the road the van goes crashes just explosions it's terrible like the carnage pure wreckage the book then goes to this house this this very large very um kind of classically quote-unquote creepy house right like it's the things you see in halloween novels it's a, it's couple stories, little spires on it. Um, and this is Manor Black. This is the house in which the book is named after. Uh, Manor Black is inhabited and lived in by the Black family. It's the, na the namesake of the house. And Roman Black is kind of the patriarch of this family. And when you go in there, Roman Black is prepping for some type of trip. Uh, he, he, him and his youngest son are in there and they're packing books. And the youngest son is like, well, you know, Daddy, what about this book? Let's take this book. And he, like, you can tell he's just very much distracted. He, he, his heart's not in it. And he's like, I need, I need to go for a walk. I can't, I can't do this right now. Um, so he takes off and he goes down to what, what is, you can assume is the family crypt. This is, this family is one of the, you know, they, they're, they're moneyed. Uh, they have, everybody's buried in the same spot. So he kind of goes and he walks in and you see one of the tombs is, is empty. Uh, they've got the kind of crypts that, you know, the graves are all stacked up on the walls. Right. They're very, very, very New Orleans-ish, uh, maybe French, uh, an homage to those. But as he's walking, um, he he walks past this giant, kind of like an old school hourglass, an old school egg timer. Except it's not sand; it's inside it. It's blood. It's it's dripping, and it's almost out. Like the time is almost done. So he, he, you can see he kind of looks at it, and the, the way he's drawn, the way he's painted. There's a lot of you, things are running through his head. He goes into the next room and. This is where the otherworldly side of things kick in. Um, there is a bit of a family council that he's there to talk to, and these are all the people who have passed on. They're all people from before. Uh, they are his ancestors, and some of them are, you know, ghostly. Some of them are half decayed. They're grisly. Some of them are only there in spirit form. Some of them are whatever of their earthly bodies are left over. And they're they're saying, you know, time is running out. You've got to name a successor, you know, and he's just like, well, but it's not unprecedented for us not to name a successor. And another ghost says, yeah, but also the carnage that, that, that happens because of that is also not unprecedented. We know what happens if we leave the Manor Black without a successor. You've got to do this. You've got to come to a decision. Your time is running out. Um, and you kind of get the idea of like his, this is not necessarily a Dorian Gray thing, but the hourglass is his lifespan. Right. And he has got to at least name a spiritual successor to the manor and to whatever magics is going on um, to pass it on to. And he's got multiple sons. Um, you know, it's not just the one youngest son that he's that he was helping him pack. So the book then cuts back to the scene of the wreckage. Um, you know, it's not just going to leave you with that there. Uh, the police have, have found four burned bodies in this van. Now, if you remember, I told you there were five. Uh, there's only four of the burned bodies in the wreckage that you found. And the fire, the way that the, the area is burned, the way that the van is burned and the grass around it, they, it, it forms a perfect circle. They're, like, this is not a natural phenomenon. And the police, I mean, these aren't, these are just small town cops. I mean, they're, they're saying, hey, well, maybe we need to get an, an arson specialist. The guy's like an arson specialist. Dude, the, the firefighters are volunteers. Um, this, we don't have the, we don't have the means for this. Um, you know, so I don't know what we're going to do. Um, 
but it's just it's just it's getting late and like we got to kind of wrap this up we got to go home at manor black roman's oldest son meets him as he walks out of the crypt uh and his oldest son is like you know we need to talk um it's like i should be the successor and he kind of holds out his hand and out of the palm of his hand blood starts oozing out of his palm and and almost straight up like it's defying gravity and he's like see i have the bleed like i'm the successor like I should, I'm the natural, I'm the firstborn. Like this is my birthright. Why won't you name me? And the father's just like, there's something about it. Like, and you can tell from the way he's approaching it that you can understand why the dad has hangups. It's like maybe this this, this person doesn't need this power. Like you're like you're weird. A, yeah, yeah, you're weird. Why are you bleeding at me? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're a little bit of an asshole. Uh, so maybe you don't deserve this. But I haven't made up my mind yet. So just you know, you need to back the fuck up, kid. Like I'm not dead yet. Um, you know, quit, quit making plans. I don't know if it's going to be you or not. The sheriff, once they get back to the, you can tell where we're bouncing back and forth. The sheriff gets back to their office again, small town cops. Um, you know, they've got one officer who's out, uh, you know, trying to bust kids who are either fucking in the back seat or they're, they're out boozing. You got the other officer who's gone to like answer a call about a cat, <laughs> about somebody's cat is either like somebody called a complaint, their neighbor shot their cat with a pellet gun. Um, <laughs> and they, they make a joke how it's probably not actually the cat. It's probably the raccoon that she thinks are the cat. Uh, really funny moment. And then the sheriff kind of just spontaneously combusts after making a really, really hilarious joke about how, um, <laughs> you know, coffee should only be drank black. Uh, actually, he makes a joke about not wanting one of those big flute and city coffees. And then his deputy is like, no, no, this is regular coffee. It's just got cream and sugar. You like your coffee the same way my 13-year-old niece does. Um, I drank mine black, which I have a lot of respect for that deputy. He's a good man. It's the um, only reason Caleb picked yeah, this book. 1,000 percent. We'll talk about that. Um, here, here. It's the only way coffee should be drank. If, you're, if you disagree, you're, it's okay. You're wrong, in the words of Craig. <laughs> so the book wraps up. It gets back to Manor Black. I love that that's what I'm known for. <laughs> yeah, for, for, the, for the Caleb, you're wrong thing. Um, and the missing figure from the van, you see her. And she's running. And she's running from these three figures. And these are not humans. Much like the figure that caused the van to go off the road and wreck. Uh, the one guy, his face is made completely of wood. The other ones are just these other material things. They're not. These are not. And it's not Groot. So, um, or the other guy. It's not Black Tom either. Um, so, but you don't know what these things are. But she's running for her life. And she gets right up to the threshold of, of Castle Black, right up to the property line. And and Roman Black is, is apparently just out taking a stroll because he's tired of all the bullshit. And he sees all this going on. He walks up right before they get her and he's like, stop, you're not doing this on my land. Uh, you don't have the power. He knows what these things are. Even though the book, Cullen, Cullen and Brian don't tell us, but, but he knows what these things are. He's like, you're not going to do this on my land. And he like raises his hand and the same blood thing happens where blood comes out of his palm. And the rocks that had lined and were, like, in order to, to determine the property line, there were rocks. There were a series of stones just laying around to line the property. They, they like, rise up and they go and they encircle where the girl was standing and they make, they come back together and they make her, it sets them inside his protective ward. And he's like, now she's under my protection. You all need to leave. And they're like, you, know, you, you just fucked up, old man. You don't know who you just pissed off. And, and that's kind of where the book leaves us. Yeah. Um, so you, you get all like this. There is something about the relationship that Cullen Bunn and Tyler Crook have that just of all the stories that Cullen gives us, very few have ever, ever come close to living. And none of them have succeeded it, but they have ever come close to giving me what Harrow County gave me. And in this first issue alone, it gets real close. It gets real, real close. You're doing the horror that Cullen does so well. Tyler's style and the way that he draws these characters and the emotion that he can pull out of these characters with his watercolors, it's just, it's extremely hard to really encompass that in words. You've got to see the pages. I'm going to go post some of these pages on our Instagram page nice. uh, and our Facebook page probably here in a little bit. They're just such a dynamic team and they... They have a, a relationship and a shorthand in their scripts that they just are really to do. They're able to take these books and make them way more than some of their parts. Nice. It, it's fantastic. I am I am sold. I am on for the ride in this book. I need to know what this bleed is. I can't wait to see more of the family council. I don't know what happens to the cops. Um, I hope the cup of coffee's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just is any word on as if this is part of the new horror universe he's setting up? I haven't heard. I know he was talking about that, um, but I, I don't rightfully know. Yeah. But it, but but like the way this book is written, there's nothing about this book that couldn't be connected to Harrow County. Right. Um, and it's from Dark Horse. Right. Where do you so, think Temporal Nights fits into that? 
It's aftershock. So yeah. it's, it's a, yeah. It's so stupid. I don't know. And that's another thing. You don't you don't know what his connected world. I want everything in the <laughs> horror universe. I don't know what his connected world, which publisher he's going to for that. Has, I think has he said? A, I think it's a Dark Horse. If it's Dark Horse, then this yeah. very much is probably that. Yeah. Um, it's whatever Cold Spots was in. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think it's a it's Dark, Dark Horse. Dark yeah. Horse, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sold completely on this. Um, again, I knew I was going to like this book. I didn't know I was going to like this book that much. Uh, I, I love it. You got to check this book out. If you haven't read it, remedy that. It's it's the hotness, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's that's our time. That's our book for the week. Nice. Those are good all the way around. Yeah. I enjoyed the shit out of that. But as always, we're going to close our show down by uh, by giving you guys some ideas. We're going to set the menu a little bit. Uh, we're going to give you guys some ideas of what might be coming out this next Wednesday that you might want to read that we we think you're going to like. Um, now, I, you know, we we've, we've been wrong before, and that's fine. Very <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I'm not wrong. There's yeah. other people sitting at this at this table that are wrong. I'm going to end up getting a tattoo that says you're wrong. Um, <laughs> but but we, these are books that we are we are we are hedging our bets, and we think that you're going to enjoy. So we'll okay, Sean. You look like you're ready. You're just you're ready, buddy. Won't you go? Sure am. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to White Trees Number One from Image Comics. It's written by Chip Zdarsky and art by Chris Anka. Uh, they got a brief synopsis of it. Is it's going to be a uh, oversized two-issue miniseries. In the fantastical world of Black Sand, pieces hard won and three unbending warriors carry the scars to prove it. Now, almost 20 years later, their children are missing and war is on the horizon. Can they put aside their memories of the war and each other for one last adventure? Just sound, it immediately jumped in my life. That sounds like my wheelhouse. Some more sword and sorcery. Nice. Matt. I want everybody to go out and pick up Outer Darkness number nine from Image Comics. John Layman and Afu Chan, uh, sci-fi horror, and great compelling characters. It's good for you. <laughs> it's medicinal. <laughs> Jerry, uh, I've got a six-issue mini series that starts up next week that I am looking forward to uh, by Boom Studios. It's a Once in Future number one mm-hmm. by Karen Gillian and Dan Mora. Uh, when a group of nationalists use an ancient artifact to bring a villain from Arthurian myth back from the dead to gain power, ex monster hunter Bridget McGuire escapes her retirement home and pulls her unsuspecting grandson Duncan museum curator into a world of magic and mysticism to defeat a legendary threat can we do morgana le fay right (laughs) hopefully explore the mysteries of the past the complicated truths of our history and the power family to save the day especially if that family has secret bunkers of ancient weapons and decades experience hunting the greatest monsters in britain's history so it's okay uh (laughs) writing um you know sword and sorcery so i am all in Sounds he seems to be doing a little bit of that lately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's in his wheelhouse. Yeah. I picked uh, Star Wars uh, Target Vader number two by Marvel Comics. Robbie Thompson, Mark Laming, Nick Klein, and Stefano Lindini. This is continuing the tale of the bounty hunters who, for some reason, think they can take out Vader. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to book six of this six issue miniseries. <laughs> how did it do? How did do? <laughs> yeah. do? Well, hey. Dingar is one of them, so I haven't figured out how he survives it yet. But. Hey, Craig. What are those bounty hunters? They're wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I, I also wanted to point out for Castro that Jungle Fantasy Annual 2019 <laughs> comes, it. Out, <laughs> comes out next week, and there's 13 covers for it. <laughs> I love your brain. I'm totally going to make that joke. Um, I think that you should add to your menus this next week a book that's going to start off. It's, it's a, also a miniseries. It's five issues. It comes from Marvel, and it is Age of Conan Valyria. Um, mainly because number one, it's Age of Conan, and the last Age of Conan book we got was the Age of Conan Belite, which I did not think I was going to enjoy, and I ended up just thanking the world of. I sure hope it's not a generic fantasy story. Um, <laughs> it, it won't be. You know how I know it won't be. Uh, it's written by Meredith Finch. Um, it's it's done by Anke with Jay Anasleto on the on the colors, and the reason I'm really excited about this book and. Some of you, if you haven't read the story that I'm about to tell you, you should go look it up. It is a precursor to Robert E. Howard's Red Nails Conan story. And Valeria is kind of the main uh, protagonist from that story. Conan's almost a side character in that story. Um, You can find a lot of that story done in comics if you get the Savage Sword of Conan omnibus, which is one of the reasons, like, I'm I'm reading it right now, and that that story's, uh, it's done in there. It's fantastic. So... Yeah, go check that book out. One of the things I love that Marvel's doing right now is this world building that mm-hmm. they're doing for the Conan world. 
it, it's they're doing a really good job of it and they're doing it with short stories and miniseries building upon Aaron's run show enough well we're ready to bring this thing home yep all right Got one little follow up, real gotcha quick. Got. The Jean Reno movie I was thinking of way back in Craig's uh, book is actually the romantic comedy called Just Visiting, starring him and Christina Applegate. And he was a French count, not a mm-hmm. Templar. I remember that. This doesn't sound <laughs> anything like my book. Christina it's, Applegate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't sound anything like my book. It's exactly, exactly, it's exactly the same story. <laughs> it's a long story. It's the exact same story. All right. Well, guys, Did we stab him with a knife at the end of it. I'm not going to spoil that. <laughs> Go out and watch it yourself. All right. We we hope you enjoyed our show. We hope you enjoyed the comic talk. Come back next week. We're going to talk about a whole new set of stuff. Uh, probably going to do news next week if uh, if memory serves and I know yes. my calendar. I get mixed up on these things. Um, but come check out our Facebook group. We're, we're having fun there. There's a lot of good conversations to be had. Um, you can see what we're reading and what we're liking if you go to our Instagram page and our Twitter page. We're at SFG Podcast and both of those. As always, if you have questions, comments, concerns, or you just want to talk to us without being in one of those public forums, uh, you can come send shoot us an email at Southern Fried geekery at gmail.com yeah don't come to our houses to talk to us that's that why, would be no, creepy no that's we no, <laughs> don't do it um if nothing else go forth love some comments